Well, I mean, are you also going to, what else are you going to do with it? As, as an educator, I mean, you could have a huge benefit, uh, not only for Washington State, uh, but, uh, but for, the, for the others. I mean, if you just mock up, if you just make a, a, even a fairly basic website where you sort of PDF the, the document and you link to the web snippets. And you say, you know, here it is. You know, that would I would love to be able to use yeah, that. Okay. Something like that. That's I mean, that makes sense. It doesn't even have to be that that fancy, no, no. you know. But um, I don't know if you use AmericanRhetoric.com. I do. Yes, I have. Ah, so I mean, you know, the, there are there are not too many outside of YouTube. There's not too many sites that are sort of about speech. And none that I know of that would archive information about speech speaking yeah. and speech writing. I wish they were a dime a dozen, well, right? They're, 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 expensive. they're, they're ridiculously they're unnecessarily expensive. Yeah, yeah. What? Oh, <laughs> that, you know. It's impossible. Oh, it's yeah. Oh, you can answer. That's fine. That's But no, I mean, I would, I would love to have access to a site like that. And in fact, for the MOOC, one thing that I want to be doing in the future, uh, for future iterations of the course, so I just ran it over the summer, it's a 10 week course, I ran it over the summer, and it was really about recording all the content. So I mean, that was, that was a massive amount of work to get the whole thing built and up and running. Uh, but now, as I'm, as I'm redesigning it, one thing I've always wanted to do is actually kind of what you're doing uh, with with speakers and speech writers, and just have short video, and then be able to post it up on on the MOOC. Uh, the nice thing is, I get to say, well, you know, I'm in Coursera, and you know, uh, hundreds of you know, tens of thousands of people, and and I know there are some writing MOOCs that have been able to get some you know fairly high profile people yeah. simply because they are a MOOC, and right now that's sort of very oh, yeah. you know the, the 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 term. So, but no, this is great, and I would love to be able to access it. I'm curious to hear what others have to say. Right Good. Well, you what you've done has been so remarkable and so broad ranging mm -hmm. with this MOOC. So, and it's very hard to pin all these things down to advice for. For students, because yeah. that's, what, that's what the 10 weeks are about. Yeah. And that's what my class mm -hmm, mm -hmm. learns about 10, 11, 12 weeks. Mm -hmm. However, you've probably seen just about every kind of student there is. Uh, you know, I, I don't know if I'd go that far. I've certainly well, seen a lot. Someone, what distinguishes a student who progresses well from one who doesn't? Well, um, where I would start is sort of the, you know, the. Uh, um, ancient rhetorical dictum, instruction, imitation, and practice. And um, any one of those three elements by themselves might produce improvement, but might not. Instruction, imitation, and practice. And even within that, if I think through that, so certainly practice, tremendously important leg. But as we teach public speaking classes, uh, perhaps sometimes we will get students who um, don't are busy, are doing other things, uh, but may not seize that opportunity to practice or requirement to practice as they might. And that doesn't mean simply practicing an individual speech, although that's important, but practicing becoming a speaker. And I would distinguish, I would say one thing that I would like to do as a speech edu educator is not just help people do speeches, but to help them become speakers. And I mean, the distinction is you know, somewhat clever wording there, but it would be not just looking at the product itself, but building someone who's flexible and dynamic and has that sense of rhetorical judgment that allows them to do multiple things. So any individual speech is no longer an issue. Writing a speech is, in many ways, not all that difficult. And tr writing a speech and training someone up on that one thing is not all that difficult. I mean, I mean in, in many ways, that's sort of like doing, you know, not animal training, but I mean, you can, train, <laughs> you can train people to do small things. That's acting, right? But developing someone into a speaker is far more burdensome and far more time intensive. So s a practice is a hugely important leg of all of that. Uh, and that doesn't mean you just practice your one speech five times before you deliver it. It means you're logging in an hour, uh, I at least each day, doing a wide range of things. Like? So, well, like thinking, you know, I'll come back to this as well, but, you know, I I'm pretty, 
I'm classically oriented. And one, because that's sort of my background, also because I think it's, it's an intellectually rich tradition, but also because it takes a much wider view of public speaking instruction than necessarily we get um, if I'm just looking in sort of consulting fields where um, I, students and sometimes clients, if, if you work in that realm, think that public speaking is just delivery. And of course, it's not. And so, um, so that practice would need to take on thinking about invention, arrangement, style, memory, and delivery, not just fetishizing delivery, because y you can have excellent delivery with terrible content, and you still look foolish. So, um, so it, it's not just delivery. Of course, on the, you know, the inverse is true as well. You can have wonderful content, but if you're terrible at delivery, it's all for naught. So, um, so, so practice and a wide-ranging practice are tremendously important. Uh, instruction, I think, is important. Um, now, you know, the, I'm sure you get the students as well who say, like, well, I don't think you can teach public speaking. It's like, well, thank you. I, I'm, uh, that's, a, that's an interesting perspective to have. Uh, the, the history of Western civilization would seem to offer a counter argument to that, but um, uh, I do think that instruction is important if if not to exactly to say here's how you should speak, but to provide you some ideas and some advice. Uh, you know, I was instructed. I think instruction is tremendously beneficial, um, but instruction imitation, uh, instruction uh, 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 practice, and imitation. So um, the other thing that I would say, and sort of when we move into classes, that typically falls out is we've got the instruction part and we've got the practice part. But we're not really populating those classes with a lot of models of imitation. And of course, the student needs to find, our students, our speakers need to find people that are really good that they can study and analyze that they can actually imitate. And I don't mean like a parody. I mean thinking about how that speaker wrote that line or delivered that line or responded to that particular audience and, and being able to study that to add to one's own repertoire of, of tactics and strategies. Um, I've got models that I would say are good models for me to imitate, the people who I like to watch and study and, 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 and look for advice from. Including? Uh, including uh, Robert Reich, former US Secretary of Labor, um, uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson, you know, some people that are very much in the, in the public eye that are experts in their field but are also excellent communicators of their expertise. And um, you know, for a lot of what I do, that mode is, is pretty applicable. You know, I love Churchill, but it's not really a model of imitation because that, that type of high oratory is rarely called for in the situations that I'm in. And certainly the, the, the delivery is not, does not map easily upon my natural style. So um, when you look at some of these other speakers, I'm, I'm looking for people who, who are doing things kind of a, sort of are in, in speaking situations I would often find myself in or in similar ones uh, and also have a speech style that I think works very well but is not too far from my own. So that's a very long answer, but you know, it comes in three parts, is uh, what, what distinguishes students who succeed from students who don't, I would say they are taking care to cultivate instruction, imitation, and practice, and recognizing that all of them require time and devotion and, and an openness. Because I would say, to return just very briefly to instruction, is because um, I run a speaking center, <clears throat> we've got tutors in there, and they're I can have two speakers come in, maybe who are of the same level, or same competency, and one is more open to coaching. One takes coaching well, the other doesn't. Mm -hmm. um, so someone comes in, and the speech, you know, I maybe think, boy, you know, that first, that first key idea, or this discussion that you have of this, I, you know, this concept or this evidence, is kind of not really working. Let's puzzle through how we can sort of tighten it up, and. One speaker who takes coaching well will be open to that, will think create, you know, creatively with me. The other one will typically provide excuses for why they, couldn't, they didn't get it the way that they wanted. So, um, you know, and I don't, I, I don't care why they didn't get it there. I, I don't care for that in my own work either. Just if I've got someone who I can work with, how can we make it better? Not, don't explain to me why it was bad in the first place. So I, I think some students take to coaching well, and some students are fairly defensive. Now, 
that makes sense. I mean, public speaking and receiving coaching is a face-threatening act. Uh, but uh, I would distinguish between them, you know, the speech itself and, and who they are as an individual. Mm -hmm. I'm concerned with the act uh, and not, you know, who you are outside of class. Well, I, I would think so. Of course, I don't know how many pub public speaking instructors would go, no, it is pure theory. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I would say that, um, you know, well, I have to see people at the end of it. Well, so, you know, there's, when I drive into work, there's a, there's a, uh, there's a, store actually it's carpet ba burns and they've got you know um one of the signs out there in the in the you know that they change the the phrase on every mm -hmm. couple of weeks and it's often actually it's usually communication oriented i don't know i think that's great i don't know how much of that has to do with carpet cleaning but apparently it does they're a great company but uh there was one i drove by uh, a few weeks ago and it was you know when you Find when you when you believe something truly, uh, eloquence follows. And of course, my answer was like, no, it doesn't. No, it doesn't, because we've got a lot of true believers, but we don't necessarily have a lot of eloquence. And and yeah, this you know, as an instructor, I deal with this in a very tangible way when I'm asking students to do exercises that should stretch their capacity, or I'm concerned with refining a very particular skill. And the 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 line I get back is. I can only speak on issues that I care deeply about. And it's like, well, that's what a limitation, you know? Uh, if you have to write, but do you at work envision you're always going to care passionately about what you're asked to speak on? You know, I, I have yet to find that job. But, um, but no, it, this, this letting your true self out. I, I mean, I don't want to, I'm certainly not arguing for, oh, it's lying. It's not at all. But I mean, it's a performance. I mean, it's a speech performance. So, the, the line I normally have on this is, it's you, but it's you at 11, right? It's not, y y y you are, I'm, when I step into a classroom, for example, right? And I'm sure you have the same experience. I have a teacher persona. It's me. Yeah. It's not not me, mm -hmm. uh, but it's not the same me that's at home. Uh, it, it is someone, I'm very aware of how I'm performing my knowledge, how I'm constructing that class, how I'm creating an experience for the students that are in there. And, um, you know, it's, it, it's a persona, it's ethos. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm cultivating that particular credibility for that audience in that situation. It's not a lie, but it's also not unstrategic. Mm -hmm. And this is one of the things where it's like, let your true self out. It's this expressivist, romantic mm -hmm. notion of, well, you know, just get rid of all the falsity. It's very enlightenment. Actually, it's so both enlightenment and romantic, although I don't know how those two fit together, but uh, you know, just releasing, unburdening one's soul. Well, depending on the subject matter and the situation, that might be wildly inappropriate. Um, so my concern in almost each and every speech encounter is finding that mixture of what do you need, what do you want to achieve, and then how can you balance your, your private goals against your speech goals? Mm -hmm. uh, they shouldn't be totally at odds, right? I don't want to, there's no situation where lying is going to be a good thing, I, or at least I don't want to coach to that. Um, I could get sidetracked here and say, oh, those students think, oh, that's, you know, it's, it's all about lying. And you, shouldn't you tell a lie if it's going to be effective? And it's like, well, you know, I think they've been, I think too many people are exposed to media where if someone says a falsehood, the, the immediacy between the speaker and that audience is, is separated. So the speaker says it, maybe the audience susses out that it's, that it's a falsehood, but then they might not interact in that exact same way. Mm -hmm. Now, most of what we do outside of the media, if we're doing presentations at work or at a civic group or a church or whatever, if you lie and you're found out, you got to see them again. So. So it doesn't really gain, it's a short-term gain for a real long-term loss mm -hmm. uh, is sort of using an overt falsehood as a way of sort of strategically gaining one's hand in that, in that situation. My concern is always with ethos in the speech in that short-term and mm -hmm. long-term ethos. Well, you know, a lot of those public speaking chapters on ethics are uh, just remonstrances to not lie. And yeah, that's true, don't lie. You know, all public speaking textbooks and indeed all public speaking instruction always still operates in the shadow of Hitler. Well, he, you know, don't make a liar. Or actually in the shadow of Hitler, in the shadow of Plato, um, uh, you know, who, who comes to, to rhetoric and says, this is, you know, this is mere 
uh, uh, lying. This is, you know, um, uh, this is a, a cookery. Um, and this is good cosmetics. You're just dressing up something in, in falsehood. Uh, but, you know, the issue is it's strategic to tell. It's usually more effective to tell the truth, and it's usually less effective to lie um, over a long term. You know, I'm not an idiot. I mean, if in, in, in the one off, maybe it is more effective to lie. But it's, that's, that's, not, that's not a public speaking strategy. That's, that's a lie. That's something separate. Uh, you know, uh, and, and certainly when we're thinking about the cultivation of ethos, um, y you're, you're playing the long game. I would say I've, I've changed over my career. Um, well, I've been exposed to more. So as someone who, you know, started public, my, the very first class I taught when I was a master's student uh, was public speaking. And, and so I, I've stayed with it the whole time. I competed in speech. I coached speech. So uh, arrangement is, is a, an issue and it is for the classical tradition. And I would say, as always, depends on the situation, right? Um, I think at, at the very least, you want to be aware of or organizational arrangement decisions, um, and this there's a there's an arrangement there's a there's a function of what that narrative of the speech is or what the experience of the speech is, regardless of whether or not it's you've got three main points and two sub points under each. In in many cases for informative speaking for business presentations, I push heavily on be very clear about organization. Um, and coming out of this MOOC, one of the things that people seem to be saying, like, oh, I didn't know how important organization was. And, and uh, so, so I, when clarity is key, then I really want to make sure that they're thinking in terms of points, our claims, our main ideas and supporting ideas. Uh, once again, in the, in the textbook tradition, I think we can very quickly and narrowly fall to claim and evidence, mm -hmm. uh, which is often a Appropriate, but sometimes it isn't, and I would say this is an issue in some textbooks. There's not that flexibility, but that's that's fine for business presentations, even if it's a wedding toast. I mean, you're not using claim and evidence. You know, the the, the groom is a good person for two main reasons. First, he's not a bastard. You know, and is, if, as evidence of this, you know, you don't do that. Nevertheless, there's a structure there. There's a there's an organization, and so I, I would say that's kind of how I've I've you know, evolved over the past 10 years is I've just been in situations where I have to move away from the very stereotypical, like, here are my, you know, five main points, and which works in many ways great for teaching, mm -hmm. where, I'm, where I want to be very clear and I want to structure how students are taking notes. But when you get into these, you know, more ceremonial speeches or, you know, epideictic encounters, um, arrangement doesn't go away, it's just different. Uh, and, and it's not like, well, I had an informative speech and it was highly structured, and then now I do my you know, ceremonial speech and it's just random talk. And it's like, well, why would that possibly be true? Um, but I do think that certainly in, in, the, in the university system, if I'm dealing with traditional age students, 18 to 22, their exposure to speech has not been professional, right? Their exposure to speech has been, you know, I have a dream, are great oratorical speeches. And I, I think they assume that those speeches don't have any structure. And so one of the key issues is being able to say, no, there's, there's a logic here. And you could rearrange this speech and it would be different. And so the issue is, is this, is this sequence of ideas, this organization, this story, this, this development uh, sometimes we'll talk about it as sort of uh, in orchestral terms. Is this, is this, you know, this, this movement, does this movement convey the right emotion here? Or does this movement convey the right idea here? Um, arrangement is sort of this, this um, hidden language of, of speech that moves it from, I have no idea what to say, to, no, you do have an idea of what to say. First figure out kind of where we're going and then start to flesh out those chunks with ideas, either overtly, you know, organized in, around main points, or sort of written more at the paragraph level. You know, what is this paragraph accomplishing? What is this unit 
uh, this, 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 this two-minute chunk? What is it designed to accomplish? And why is this accomplishment happening in the first third of the speech and not in the final third of the speech? Yeah, yeah. So I mean, just saying it's, you know, it's not random, or it shouldn't be anyway. And um, you know, even if we're dealing with short one-minute speeches, um, you know, there's got to be a reason why something comes first and something comes last. Uh, or at least there should be. Or, or at the very least, you should make a decision about it as opposed to just letting it happen to you. So. Oh, well, you know, uh, once again, it depends on the purpose. So, but in many cases, for what, I'm, for what I end up working with people on, and not just students, is the story, the story provides a different way of understanding the idea. Right, um, in some cases, a very comfortable way of understanding the idea, or an easy to envision, or easy to identify with a way of understanding the idea. Um, though, uh, for most business speakers, for most students, it shouldn't be the only way, unless, of course, that's unless it's, it's a someone a time when you're explaining your experience. But if a, if a story or a narrative is used as part of a larger idea or explanation or argument, right, we can think of sort of the, the story as providing um, a, a, an analogical way of understanding the idea, but then usually it's good to sort of come back and sort of explain how that story is generalizable or how it applies to other situations and not let it, you know, of course, I mean, that if we're operating, if we're trying to make an argument, just having a, a one story in making a generalizable claim is there's a huge disconnect between those two. It's inappropriate evidence. Um, so I, I think you know stories are hugely important. But by the same token, you know I've got other non-textbook speeches that are like always oh, story, 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 and it's like well, it's one form, uh, and uh, uh, it, it, it's usually not the only form, and often it's not the best form. Um, you know, evidence, support, ways of providing multiple points of, of entrance to a topic, uh, you know, why not have varied ideas, right? Why not have varied ways? Narrative is one tool in the speaker's toolkit. If that's the whole toolbox, then they need work. Well, gosh, you know, um, and, and sometimes this is, after years and years, this is one of the harder things to do, even though I've seen it a lot. You know, you get up there and someone is very monotone, and they can't, n nerves I can sort of now figure around, but even if they're not nervous, and then they're just kind of like, well, you just, you're not very interesting, you know, or you're not, you're not really committing to it. Uh, first off, I would not want, I, if someone wants to use me as model of imitation, fine. I would never say you should speak this way, right? That's, that, that's, that's highly problematic for multiple, multiple reasons, uh, but, um, but if some, I, you know, I, ideally I'd want to sort of draw out of the person a, a distinct, interesting, engaging speaking style. And that's going to vary based on the person. One, I would say is, so how do, how do we get them there? So let's say they're not nervous. Okay, let's, let's sidebar that. They're not nervous, they're just not very engaging. Okay, well, what do we do? Um, first off, they got to see it themselves. Okay, so, so as, as much as it hurts watching yourself, on videotape, I think it's essential. And not watching it once, not just watching it, sort of cringing and putting it aside. Really just in a, in a masochistic sense, watching yourself repeatedly, the same video and, uh, and different videos again and again and again. This has this helped me. So for this MOOC, I had to record and review hours of footage of myself. And I mean, it never stops hurting. I mean, it's always painful. Uh, but it's always beneficial. So one, they got to see it. Um, two, I'd go back to model of imitation. Say, well, who do you think? And it doesn't have to be someone famous. Uh, you know, someone from your, you know, Boy Scout troop. I don't know if they do speaking in Boy Scout troops. Whatever. So what? Uh, so take a look at them. What is? It, they're kind of similar to you. What are they doing? And then maybe start from there. Say, well, now do it in their style. Write a paragraph in their style. Perform in their style. And trying to get them closer and closer to finding a model limitation as a way of drawing out their, their individual identity. Then when we get to sort of just basic delivery things, I think there's a lot that we can do. A lot of sort of delivery exercises. Certainly 
projection, I would say, is key. So get you know good breathing exercises. Get them in a place where they hear the appropriate level of projection. So it's not just you know uh, I, I'm being I'm speaking just to be heard, but really filling the room with sound. Uh, so breathing exercises. I have come to become a much bigger advocate of. You know what I have even here? Yeah. So you know these used to be all, all the rage, but. Um, you don't really see them so much around anymore. Um, so back when public speaking was in speech departments, uh, and even if we look at competitive speech to this day in the speech events, there'll be uh, you know platform addresses, and then there'll be oral interp. So I mean, this is this is just an oral reading book. This is from the the forties, and uh, it's got advice on reading. You know, on, on reading and performing oral performance for prose and for radio, and and but then it's also got lots of oh, it's got I didn't know it had shooting of Dan McGrew, Robert uh, the shooting of Dan McGrew, which is by Robert Service, who's oh, a yeah. Canadian poet, um, and uh, songs of the sourdough I think, and uh, this is from Spell of the Yukon, but that's a great poem. It's a wonder. It's fun, but um, but uh, getting them to read. Getting them to perform reading, and because here there is because one of the things that comes through in an engaging speaker is the emotionality in their voice, and, and being able to do that. As much as I am an advocate of making sure that public speaking includes invention, arrangement, style, as well as memory and delivery, I think if we really want to focus and refine delivery, maybe sidelining that invention arrangement stuff and saying here. Here is a story uh, or a poem, and there, there, there is sound in these words, there is timing in these words, there is pacing, and there is emotion. Your job is to perform it. You don't have to come up with it. You know, mm -hmm. Alfred Lord Tennyson already did that. Mm -hmm. uh, but you need to perform it as you uh, and, and make it something interesting and distinct. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, the, um, I've, I've, I've come back to sort of looking again at sort of speech competition because it's, it's actually a snapshot of the communication, speech communication discipline from many years ago. And it has sort of impromptu events, you know, limited prep in the standard, you know, uh, uh, standard speech and mm -hmm. interp events. You've got limited prep, platform addresses, and oral interpretation. Mm -hmm. and and those are the basic ones. And then some other places you'll get discussion or radio, which still you know, activates them. Uh, but I sort of look at that and I go, boy, you know, that's actually a pretty good toolkit. And what has happened as I look up at those public speaking textbooks is the limited prep stuff went away. The oral interp sure as heck went away. And they only focused on the speeches. And really, when they focus on the speeches, they're focusing on the writing of the speeches. Mm -hmm. And even within that, they're focusing on argumentation. Mm -hmm. And they're not focusing on delivery, because how can you in a book, mm -hmm. uh, uh, to some degree? Um, so you know, it, it, I, I just think that there needs to be this much sort of bigger, broader uh, issue. And you know, also, as I'm sure you have experienced, we just deal with such an abbreviated timeline as public speaking teachers. Mm -hmm. You know, as rhetoricians, we used to have years to cultivate a speaker. You know, I've got Quintilian's Institute of Oratory. He's got, you know, he's got, here's what you do when the kid has a nanny, you know, and then here's what you do when you retire. I mean, that was his view of the timeline of studying and refining your speech and in a lifetime. And now we've trunked it down to, well, we've got a course and we've got 10 weeks. Uh, are you all on quarters? We're on quarters, too. You've got 10 weeks to even introduce, well, gosh, there's just so much that needs to happen. And it needs time to, you know, uh, to, 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 to percolate. Um, and, and introducing something, and, and even within that, we, if I'm not sure the structure of your course, I'm trying to fight against this myself, we, uh, just thinking against the textbook model, we start them off by saying, write an informative speech. Well, we look back to, you know, the, the four, you know, hundreds of years, they would start off much earlier, and they would start with very basic stories, program nasmata, so a, a series of practice activities, building up to, by the way, declamation, what we start with. They build up to that. But they start off with stuff like, you know, reading a fable, performing a fable, doing imitation, really not, ba not, not 
not basic stuff, elemental stuff, mm -hmm. and saying, you have to refine certain abilities. This is why I think rhetoric as a tradition is so useful, and perhaps why speech teachers tend to have such a concern with educational issues, because you know the we were doing scaffolded education, uh, you know, in, in, you know, in you know before the you know before Rome. So I mean, um, there there is this notion of if you're going to refine this skill, you got to start small. And, but not just itemize it. All these things interact with one another and, and influence one another. But I would say typically what we do in a college class is we start really at the end point of, of a lot of speech instruction. And, and it's tough because we're getting them at very different levels and, and you know, they've got different life experiences and background experiences and they're gonna go on to do different things. Um, and, and so we've gotta provide some helpful and useful advice but uh, you know, when I look at it, I'm like, wow, we've really been we've really been limited into a very you know into a into a very tiny box. When if the goal is to educate speakers, that's a long timeline. Even in you know early you know the early U.S. colleges, you had you know the entire you know the entire time was spent thinking about rhetoric um, as as sort of the the, the capstone experience. Anyway, well, nothing to be done for that, I suppose. I mean, <laughs> you know, can can't, you can't go to the provost well, and go like, it, yeah. And we can tell our students that. Mm -hmm. that Going back to them, you mentioned you re referred to fear, and I think I saw something on, on the video in which you distinguished between performance and yeah, communication. Now that's that's not my distinction. That's um, that's someone from the communication. Yeah, communication discipline. But um, and all that I've been saying about it's performative. There's sort of two dis there's two reads of performance here. By right, performative, I in that mode I'm saying well you're you're being dynamic, but you're aware of your presence and its interaction with the audience. Now, typically in that communication performance distinction, it is saying performance is when, uh, when people tend to go, uh, well, often when they go off the rails, they assume that writing and speaking are separate things. And so they'll go in and they'll write an essay, basically. Mm -hmm. Or they, they feel like, oh, you know, my speech is just, they write out this thing, and then they get up there and they read it. And that's not a speech. Um, 